And so, Father God, I just pray that as we open your word, that you would come and manifest yourself. And as, we, as I teach and we listen, that, Father God, that you would bless us, encourage us. And I pray, I see it in my spirit, that, the, that as, as I'm talking to you about the Great Commission in a second or two, I see all the empty, you open your eyes, even though you're praying, I see all the empty seats filling up. I, I, mean, I, I can see it in my spirit now. I see all the empty seats filling up with your friends who don't know Jesus, your family who don't know Jesus, your colleagues, your neighbors, people that you bump into coming to see Jesus. That's the fruit that I would pray for out of what I'm going to share this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, as I say, good morning. And today we're diving into one of the most uh, powerful uh, commands of Jesus, the center of our, our faith, um, to us as believers. It's found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Uh, and in that, you'll just, I'm going to read it just in a second or two, we find a, a short passage of scripture which has become known in Christianese, Christian speak, as the Great Commission. Okay, that's Christian language for this. But the, the gist of it is that Jesus commissions his disciples to go and do what he did. Amazing. But even greater things than he did, yeah. we are to do. Yeah. Okay, and we'll just sit there for a minute. Okay. Yeah. Jesus said, it's not me that's saying that. Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit comes onto his people, we will do even greater things than Jesus did. That's what we are being commissioned into. And I particularly want to just mention to the young people who are here. By young, I mean if you're under 25. I just want to speak straight to your heart and say you're included in this too. It's so easy as a young person to sit there and think this is for all the kind of mature adults and all the rest of it. But this is most definitely something that's for you too. And how I know that is because both, both Heather, Pastor Heather and I, we not only committed our lives to Jesus when we were teenagers, but we felt a call in our life to give everything that we are to this great cause. Heather, when she was about 14, and I when I was 16. So we know that God speaks to young people, and God will impart to you an aspiration to serve him for the whole of your life. Now, whether you're under 25 or over 25, it all applies to you, but I just want the young people particularly to get this in there. Now, Jesus is speaking post-resurrection. So the power, the Bible tells us, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that's working in us now. Okay, so we're not doing this by being uh, better taught. Forget it. We're not doing this by reading the Bible harder. We're not doing it that. We're, we're not doing this by any effort of ours except that effort where it's energized by the very presence of God's Spirit in us. Yeah. That the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that works in us who believe. That's the power. That's the context in which this is being said. You see, why I'm saying all this is because when we read the Great Commission, almost always the natural reaction is, well, yeah, that's okay. That was good for them then, but it's nothing to do with me now. And there are some Christian teachers that will tell you that the Great Commission actually is nothing to do with you now. It's an old thing, but that's a lie because, uh, for reasons that I'll unpack in the next 15 minutes. But here is the words of Jesus post-resurrection. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that works in us. And he says this, Jesus came to his disciples and he said to them, all authority and heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always Amen. to the very end of the age. Amen. He is with us to the very end of the age. Now, that we, we could literally do a 10-week series on this one few verses. I haven't got time to do that, so I'm going to jump in and just race us through. In this commission, Jesus is doing something absolutely incredible. He's speaking into your heart and to mine and to those first disciples, a sense of purpose and direction that they could get absolutely nowhere else. You see, the world promises us purpose. The world promises us direction. By the world, I mean all the stuff around us. You know, you're on your social media, and it promises you the world. You're on uh, TV, and it promises you the world. You're a reader of self-help books and all of that stuff, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. They promise you the world, but none of them can deliver what Jesus can deliver into our lives. He delivers a sense of purpose and direction that is unmatched anywhere else, from anywhere else, 
at any time, anywhere. Because of his uniqueness, all power and have all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. So what powers are not given to him? None. What sickness is not reachable by his power? What sense, what emotion, what depression, what concern, what anxiety, what troubled mind can we have that Jesus is not over? None. Absolutely none. Now, I know that we're making a connection here. And if any of that's applied to you, you're thinking, yeah, none except me. But you, no, 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 no. This authority that's given to Jesus is over me. It's over you. It's over everything. Yeah. It's over, it's over, it's over and above. That's why we're doing this 21 days of prayer. I don't want to get onto a cul-de-sac here. But that's why we're having 21 days of prayer. That's why we're having extra prayer meetings. Not, not maybe clear. Not so we can gather tonight. Tonight's our last one, seven to eight. Be there. Please be there. Let's have an upsurge in this church of prayer. It's not enough, friends, that 20 people come. It just, it's just not enough. Yeah, I know two or three are gathered. Jesus is there. And we've been there for 11 hours of prayer since we started till now. And it's been wonderful. It's been absolutely amazing. But at this moment, we are in a, we are in a flux moment in, this, in the life of this church and in your life, and in the lives of those that you love who don't know Jesus. Now, if I said, okay, that you come tonight and you pray for that person in your life who doesn't know Jesus that you really love, and that they are more likely to respond to your invitation than not, what are you choosing? Are you choosing Netflix or prayer? Please come. Please come. Let's have an upsurge of prayer. Because what we're not doing is begging God. We're not gathering and saying, God, oh, help us, this and that. And the next thing, that you can pray that prayer in your personal devotions. When we are getting together, we are praying and we're saying, the whole authority of God. Yeah. Come on. You're over everything. Yeah. Jesus, we declare that you're over everyone and everything. Yeah. And if I don't believe that, that's why I come to prayer. Because God will do something in you that will tune your prayers up to that. That's what he's doing for me. As I've been gathering, I've found that my faith is rising up. My faith is increasing for those around me. I've been praying for my sister and my brother-in-law. I absolutely have. And my two sisters, in fact, but my sister and brother-in-law particularly. I've been praying for them as I hang out with them. I pray, you know, something is changing in that relationship because I'm gathering and praying. Okay, now this is not to make anybody feel guilty. This is a time of grace. Yes. That's why we're doing the whole grace thing. But please, if you really believe it, get back it up with prayer. Yeah. It's there because Jesus, when he's commissioning his people, back on my notes now, when Jesus is commissioning his people, he's, he's launching a new era. He's saying the world was like that and the world now is like this. Yeah. Now to the first disciples, this was something incredible. Uh, as I've been uh, studying this and praying over it and thinking what to say to you, it strikes me, and this is my three kind of headings, that the, the Great Commission, to call it that, is our calling, but it's absolutely dynamic and powerful in at least three ways in our lives. I think the Great Commission is explosive, yeah. I think it's relevant, and I think it's a call to action. Now, as Christians, we kind of like the first two, we're not so keen on the third one, to be honest. Right, that's, you know, otherwise the church would be everywhere on fire the whole world over, wouldn't it? Because everybody's responding to this call to action. So let's just get our hearts ready for that. So anyway, firstly, it, the Great Commission is explosive. And this is why I think it is. You see, um, it's on a mountain. I don't know if you remember, when we read the thing, the, if you read the, chapter, the few verses before, you see the actual location of this is a very high mountain. And mountains feature a lot in Matthew's Gospel. From the very beginning all the way through to the end, mountains feature because they are symbolically, as well as physically, what they call, we call today, a thin space. A place where it's evident that God is accessible, that God is there. Now, our mountain now might be our bedroom. Our mountain now might be, because Jesus said, go in your closet and pray. Uh, don't you pray under the stairs and you'll be covered there or, or whatever. Uh, your, your place, your place of um, communion with God, of, of intimacy could be anywhere. But in that moment, there's a thin space between uh, the 
the power, the presence, the authority of God and our lives. Does that make sense? So all the way through Matthew's gospel, you see uh, important things are said on mountains. Jesus uh, gathers people together and teaches them in a mountain context. He goes for prayer on his own and with others in a mountain context. Uh, the transfiguration, when uh, his relationship with his father God was absolutely publicly displayed, is on a high mountain. And here we find ourselves in this mountain, this thin space. It's and that's signaling to us as we read it that this is a, a mountain-moving kind of moment, if that makes sense. There's something really amazing happening at this. This is out of the ordinary. This is something really error-changing and special. I think if you want an illustration of it, it's like when phones went from, remember Blackberries, some of you? you know, when it was all keys and everything, everybody wanted one of them right? Because you could type, if you had fat thumbs like me, you couldn't, but um, you could type a wee message and send it to people. It was like completely brand new. That was from, we used to have a phone that we had to dial. We moved to th that. And then all of a sudden, somebody invented, uh, uh, Apple invented the glass screen that you can touch and move. And whew, you make it bigger and smaller and you can take photos with it and all the rest of it. And what happened to the buttons? They're gone. You know, a few people hung on to them saying, God gave us these buttons. Nobody will take it away. But eventually they're obsolete because something new has come yeah. and it has taken over. And something new will come again in that context. But for us right now, this is the point. In this moment on the Mount of Conf uh, uh, the Great Commission, yeah. something's changing. We're moving from Blackberry to iPhone or screen phone. We're moving from one whole way of thinking. Yeah. It's the pre-industrial revolution to the industrial revolution. It's, it's that kind of level of change times 10. Okay, you get that? And what's changing there? I was praying and praying and praying, trying to get insight into this. What is happening here, Jesus? And I sense the Spirit say to me, there was two things happening here, or one thing happening here, but with two things, and here it is on the screen, is that the love of God in Christ Jesus meets the authority of God in Christ Jesus. And where love and authority meet, there is missional advance. Okay, now when I was praying over this, I think, yeah, that makes sense to me. Because I've been to loads of conferences and all that where people have talked about the authority of God. You go and do this, you've got the authority of God to this and that and the next thing. And basically, if you're not careful, it makes you kind of um, scream at your neighbors. Do you know what I mean? Because I've got authority and I'm going to scream at my neighbors. But what I sensed the Holy Spirit was saying is that in the person of Jesus, in this moment, we see his love and his authority coming together. And what do I mean by his love? Um, just this. In uh, Mark 10, 45, Jesus talks about his love for humanity. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Wow, that's love. We remember his words, John 3, 16. You know those, don't you? Most of us know that. Uh, even if you're not a Christian, you probably know those words because you see them at football matches and all sorts of things like that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that is Jesus, so that we might be redeemed. We might have a whole life ahead of us. That is the love of God uh, manifest for us. In 1 John 3, we read, this is how we know what love is. Not that we loved God, but that he first loved us. Yeah. Now, what's that got to do with us? Well, I'll come to the application in a minute or two, but let me just sow a seed. Think of the people you love. Think of the people you love. And we'll come back to them just in a second or two. One of my uh, friends, uh, Pastor Karen at Kingsgate, used to have a lovely little saying. Uh, and it was because um, when she first moved to Peterborough, when they went to plant a church there, they started in their house, there were six people. I tell you now, there's like four and a half thousand in that church. But when they started, there were six people. And uh, the six people were there for the first like three years. They just couldn't get any kind of breakthrough at all. She was praying, 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 God, what's going on? This is, this is painful. We've moved here. We, we, we've sent your calling to come and plant a church in Peterborough and nothing's happening. And Jesus said to her, she, she wrote it down in her journal and she speaks of it openly. She says, Jesus said to me, how can you expect revival in a city that you don't love? Wow. And she's like, whoa, whoa. She got brought up to that. If you don't love a place, you'll never revive it. If you don't love a person, you will never invite them. You'll never have opportunity to impart anything to you of your faith. And so, as well as the authority of God, which we'll come to in a minute or two, we also have this sense and we have to fall in love 
with the people around us, the people, lost people all, everywhere uh, around us. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, good. So Jesus gave, uh, calls the uh, disciples together, and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, we think that's great. They would have been remembering something, because a few chapters earlier, in, Mark, uh, in Matthew, rather, chapter 10, we know that Jesus sent them out on a practice run. Okay, and he sent them out on a practice run of ministry with these words. Jesus called the 12 disciples to him, uh, this is Matthew uh, 10, and gave them authority, sound familiar, to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And Matthew 10, it's worth a read, is the kind of manual for missional movement, all the things that God is doing there. So when Jesus says, all authority is given to me, and then he commissions them, uh, what they'd been practicing in Matthew 10 is now for real. And the great thing is, when they went out in Matthew 10, you can read this, uh, to do all this stuff, Jesus didn't go with them. Jesus was back at base, as it were, because it says when they came back, they reported to him of what was going on. But in this commission, this must have been ringing in their ears. It must have been amazing. And I will be with you always, is what he says now. So you're going back out real time to do what you've practiced, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. His authority is given to them. The first sending was scary. The second sending, I suppose, was equally scary, but now his presence goes with them. And we have this beautiful thing, I believe, where authority and love meet, there is a missional movement. So if we are individually and together not moving missionally enough, I think we need to concentrate on these two things. We have to concentrate. What's our love level for the people around us? What's our love level for our street, our neighborhood, our town, our cities, our uh, South Lanarkshire, for our nation? What's our love level about there? And that will show itself through in what we say about it. And what is our authority level? You know, uh, what can we declare over that? I hope that's going to make sense as we, we go on. Where authority and love meet, there is missional movement. John Wimber uh, wrote many books about uh, evangelism and the power of the Holy Spirit says this. Power was to come through the Holy Spirit. Power is the ability, the strength, the might to complete a given task. Authority is the right use of the power of God. So, for example, if you're a traffic policeman uh, or woman, you don't physically have the power to stop cars, and you wouldn't even try it, would you? But you have the authority to do that. You have the authority to stop the cars because you have authority from a uh, you have authority, bigger pardon, from a higher power to do so. Wow! The disciples set out and reached the world. They took it personally this great commission. I don't think any of those disciples, from what I've read on, it was thinking, um, this is amazing, Jesus, but there's 11 of us here, and it's for them 10 and not me. Because every one of them went on, they took it personally and activated it in Jesus' name. As they were commissioned to their world, so are we commissioned to our world. Are you up for that? Yeah. Wow. We are commissioned to our world. That brings me to my second point, that the Great Commission is absolutely relevant in the world that we live today. Now, you can read all sorts of stuff on Google and all the rest of it, um, which will convince you otherwise of this. But if there's one thing I want you to land in your heart and mind, your heart first and in your mind, is that this is relevant to us today. Okay. Some argue that it was only for the 11. Okay, well, I struggle with that because when we get into Acts of the Apostles, which we will in 30 seconds, we see that it expanded out to a whole group. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people took this great commission. So it's not just for the 11. Some argue it's too difficult now. No, people are not really interested, you know, and, you know, they'll think worse of me. I might get into trouble if I share the, the gospel news. Or that, you know, so, so let's forget it. But that's not true. Bear in mind and I'll come to it in a second or two, when the disciples were doing this in Acts, they were persecuted to the point of death because of their Christian faith. And so fact they scattered, and tens of thousands of Christians were, were massacred because they believed in Jesus. They, they were teaching a heretical thing, so it was said against them. So the world is no harder now than it was then. It's just harder in our head now than it was then. That makes sense? Yeah. So that's not true. Some argue that we are in a much more tolerant world today. And so 
anybody's faith counts. Anybody's lack of faith counts. This is my faith. You have your faith, and we're all happy and hunky-dory. That sense of universalism is not biblical. Okay? Anyway, that's another talk. Maybe we'll do it some other time. But unless your friends and family submit their lives to Jesus, unless you submit your life to Jesus, eternity is close to you. It sounds terrible, but all of God's presence, all of God's power, all of God's energy is directed towards every man, woman, and young person on earth who lives now and who will live in the future having opportunity to accept Him. That's why we're missional, because not only are we helping someone's life now, but we're sealing it for eternity. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life in all its fullness. That wasn't just about, you know, we've got pie in the sky and when we die, we'll, we're going to have a great party. That, that's great. But it's now. Yeah. Every single person you can meet's life is better with Jesus than without them. Yeah. Get that in your heart and mind. Yeah. I, I've asked God to do this work in me. I really have. You know, I can't meet somebody whose life will not be better with Jesus. And what inspires me is um, a, a testimony of a friend of mine, actually, a guy called Tom. Uh, Tom was uh, in his uh, early 20s, and he uh, worked in uh, a government office. And uh, to all intents and purposes, everything he tells, everything on the, his life from the outside looked absolutely perfect. He was earning well. He, had a, he was buying his own home. He had a nice car. He had good friends. And out every weekend with all his friends and all the rest of it, everything looked absolutely hunky-dory. One day, someone in the office invited him to the Alpha course at their church, at the church in Peterborough, where Heather and I were there for 11 years. I said, I know this Tom very, very well. He's a great friend. Um, so he was invited to come along to Alpha. And then he, uh, through the whole process of coming to Alpha, he, he, he found Jesus and surrendered his life to Jesus. And then what he testifies to is, oh, this is important. Although it looked like everything was perfect, had a good job, good relationships, nice house, good car. He didn't have a Labrador, so he wasn't quite made, but you know what I mean. Everything on the outside looked absolutely perfect. He said, what she didn't know when she invited was that on the inside, I was dying. I had no idea of who I was, what my purpose in life was. I was drinking myself to sleep every single night in there, going to bed early so that I would sober up in time to go to work in the morning. And he said, I did that every single day of my life. I went out the weekend with my friends and put on the whole kind of, you know, bravado thing, got totally drunk and all of that stuff. And he said, all that was going on was inside of me. So that convinces me afresh that there's no one that you can meet, however things look for them, however perfect things look, that whose life will not be better without Jesus. And I find that a, high, a really highly motivating thing. Yes, it's difficult to talk about Jesus. Of course it is. But it's our calling. It's our mission. So one of the things that I've been thinking about, again, I've just got to watch my time a little here, is that when you say it's too difficult, or when we say the world's too tolerant, or when we say, you know, it's not for us, it's for others, um, what we are allowing to happen is we're allowing our, our thoughts and the thoughts of the kind of outside world, the, the culture, if you like, shape our missional endeavor. Does that make sense? But we're people of the Word, aren't we? As Christian people, we, we, uh, we seek the presence of God, and we turn to His Word for our guidance and direction. We, don't we? Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, three of us will read it anyway. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so we're people of the word. So we take our direction from the commands from God's word, not the culture around us. And this is a calling, particularly um, challenging uh, in this day. So when we take turn to the word and see how the first disciples lived out the Great Commission, we're getting some clues of how we can do it. Okay. So just turn to your neighbour. Just give him a high five. Say you've done well. You're all, you're 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 awake. Come on. Now turn to them and say, there's a blessing coming for you right now. I honestly believe that. I honestly believe that. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that more than intelligence, more than ideas, you would come and impart to us a deep sense of your presence right now. 
and this wonderful privilege it is ours to serve you as we look at your word. So just let his word speak to us. So very quickly, I, I can't do every single chapter in the New Testament, but I'm going to do some of them, okay? So if you're a scribbler, you might want to write these references down because you'll look at them in life group this week, I'm quite sure. So looking at the first disciples, how did they react after the Great Commission? Well, they went from the Great Commission, they went into what's recorded in Acts of the Apostles. And in chapter 1, verse 8 of Acts of the Apostles, we read this. Uh, recording the words of Jesus, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, witnesses, that is gospel carriers. So, immediately after the Great Commission, we're getting this promise, and then he said, go and wait till the Holy Spirit comes. Uh, John Stott, the Christian writer, argues this, we can no more restrict the Great Commission and its command to witness than we can restrict the promise of the Holy Spirit. So if a Christian people are telling you, yeah, we're all about getting the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's for fundamentally missional purposes, communicative and witnessing purposes. Following the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, uh, because he was a Christian, he got stoned to death. And after that, what happened? There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of, listen to this, Judea and Samaria. So what was spoken of is now happening. Listen to this though. Except the apostles. Okay, this is important. Uh, this is important. Except the apostles. Because now the church goes like that, it explodes. And what is happening in that moment is that the communication of the gospel message becomes the responsibility. I mean, it always was, but it becomes clear it's the responsibility of ordinary people. Okay, get it clear? Because as they went out, out and out and out, within three years, the whole of the Roman world had heard about Jesus Christ. And it wasn't because the apostles went out. It's because the flock went out. You get it? So something amazing is happening here that it's given to me and you. We're not the apostles, but we are that group that's gone out there. And what were they doing? Acts chapter 8, verse 4. I'm, I'm, I know it's a few verses, but we'll be, soon be finished that. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. They went about sharing the gospel with other people. Ordinary men and women, empowered by God's Spirit, and not the apostles at this time, but all believers are charged with and activate this sense of going with the gospel message. Now, by preaching, we're not talking about getting on the street corner necessarily and preaching, preaching like that. We're talking about this word that you can see there. I'm not even going to try and say it. Evangel well, I'm going to try and say it. Um, Evangelizaminio. Okay. Okay. If that's not how you say it, it's how we say it now. Okay. Uh, and what that means is living a life and speaking, living and speaking the presence and the, the, the gospel of Jesus. Come on. That's what we are being charged to. Uh, Kenneth Scott writes this as an observation about this whole thing. The chief agents in the expansion of Christianity appear not to have been those who made it a profession or a major part of their occupation, but men and women who earned their livelihood in some purely secular manner and spoke of their faith to those whom they met in this natural fashion. The scattered church of Jerusalem includes you and me. This is awesome, isn't it? The transfer of the witness and the gospel sharing is to the ordinary people. Okay, turn to the person next to you, high five them and say, you're very ordinary. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, just in case. Yeah. And in this context, that's a blessing because the gospel challenge is given to the ordinary people. It's given to ordinary people for ordinary people around us. It's not some special thing. It's ordinary people like you and me with the ordinary people around us that have to hear this message of Jesus. What about Peter? He was present on the mountain. What did he write 30 odd years later? He wrote about his experience. What does he think about the Great Commission? Is he thinking it was on the mountain, there was 11 of us and it's just us and it's all over. The world's too hard now. No, not at all. This is what he says. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord 
always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. In other words, be ready to share the good news to those around us. Uh, recently, uh, an organization called Barna did a study amongst Christians, uh, which is not very encouraging, but uh, it won't be harvest, okay? Uh, do we as Christians have a personal responsibility to share our faith was the question that they asked Christians, tens of thousands of them. And the responses according to the study were that Christians were increasingly answer that question with a no. Okay? In 1993, however long ago that was, uh, 30 years ago nearly, 89% of Christians who had shared their faith believed it was their personal responsibility. And now, in 2023, only 64% of that group said so. Okay. So, so what? Man, 89% is bad. What about us? What about our fellowship? What about all the people connected here with Harvest that are here right now, you're, you're sitting amongst uh, or watching online? What about us? Uh, I, I'm praying. I have been praying for two weeks now uh, since we started this prayer thing that if that puzzle, that question was asked of us, it'd be, uh, well, I'm not saying 100%, but it's 99.9 .9 recurring, I'll take that, of people would say, yeah, it's my responsibility. I need help to do it. I, I, want, I need encouragement to do it. I need the power and presence of God to do it. But I'm willing. I realize that it's my responsibility. You see, it, uh, the, the heart of the Great Commission is a word, go and make disciples. Jesus called us to be disciples who make disciples. The word disciple means learner. Okay, we're learning from Jesus and we're gathering a group of learners. That's what we should, nobody's complete, nobody knows it all, but we are learners before Jesus. So if you call yourself a disciple, you can't be called a disciple unless you're a learner who's adding more learners. Okay, I know that's not easy to swallow. But the gospel's been given. It's now released onto ordinary people, and it's been confirmed by the person sat next to you that you're an ordinary person, right? Ordinary message, a wonderful message given to ordinary people to go to ordinary people. We're all empowered to do it by God's Holy Spirit. So let's go. Let's do it. Let's get out there. Let's learn what it means there. Okay, I know you're still not convinced, so what about Paul? Paul the apostle, he wasn't an apostle. He wasn't on the mountain. In fact, he, at that stage, was a persecutor of Christians. He went about, his life ambition was to kill Christians. You can read about it in Acts of the Apostles. In Acts chapter 9, God comes and he has what's called a Damascus Road experience. He was on his way to Motherwell. And uh, God the Holy Spirit uh, and uh, Jesus in a powerful vision appeared to him on the, uh, just down there, under the bridge. Right, that's where, that, you know, in our, in our world, it, it was as ordinary as that. He's on his way from Hamilton to Motherwell with the intention of killing Christians in Motherwell. And the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus comes on him and wakes him up and says, Paul, I want you to turn your life around. And instead of persecuting Christians, disciple them. Yeah. And you, we know that he did that because the, more or less the second half of the New Testament is from his pen. Yeah. So he wasn't on the mountain. He wasn't even a Christian then. Does he believe in the Great Commission for us? Let me just prove it. Yes, good answer. Okay. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, instructions to the church. Salvation is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, hallelujah, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, you get it? There's two bits to this. He gave us, he reconciled us to himself, for which we say, amazing, and at the same time, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses and sins against them, but entrusting us and entrusting us with the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. Amen. Come on, hallelujah, right enough. Or what about 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5? He writes to a young Timothy, a young kind of disciple, says this, work at telling other people the good news and fully carry out the ministry that God has given you. Still not convinced. What about Colossians chapter 4, verse 5? Use your heads as you live and work amongst outsiders. That's those who are not Christians. Don't miss a trick. Make the most of every opportunity and be gracious in your speech. And I could go on. And actually, in the object of fairness, 
I've written down all the Bible passages that say, don't share your faith. Okay, hold it to yourself. Don't share it. Keep it to yourself. Christianity is a personal thing. Christianity is like that. Well, you know, the verses that say we live in, a, you know, a, a world of relevance, and so everybody's story, everybody's beliefs are equal. I've looked up all the verses about all of them and written them down here. Oh, you'll be pleased to know that there's absolutely none. Yeah. Not one, not half, not a quarter of a verse that says don't witness. In fact, I googled it. Give me a Bible verse that means I don't have to be a witness. And it churned around and returned. There are no Bible verses that say that. So I thought, oh, Google's old school. Let's go chat GPTI. Okay, let's go AI. So in the chat GPT, I put in there, please help me here. Chat GPTI. Give me some verses that mean I don't need to witness about my faith. And it churned around and it churned around and it came up. And it says, there are no verses in the Bible that say you must not share your faith. Okay. Amen. Just let that land. Simply let it land. Because we declare and we say it all the time, Assemblies of God, this church, we are people of God's word. Yeah. And I think we need a refresher on this. I think I need my heart touched by the Holy Spirit afresh to realize that it's not just back then, but it's relevant right now. And there's no biblical argument against it. Uh, at all, as far as I can see, and, and ChatGPT is more authoritative than me on this, and that says no. But friends, when I was prepping this, I actually had a day or two when I felt quite guilty. I was thinking, yeah, let, um, I, you know, I, I let the enemy was starting to come to me with guilt about, well, you're a, you're a pastor and you've been a Christian, whatever number of years, quite a few years, and you, what have you been doing about witnessing and all the rest of it? And uh, when I actually got to the, on Thursday evening, actually, it was a little bit of a breakthrough moment for me. Uh, I came to the Alpha uh, team gathering, and uh, one of the other team was able to take over some responsibilities I had. So I actually took the moment to come up and just kneel here. And for an hour, I just sat there. I was kneeling actually in the front there, and I was just asking God, God, I need you to help me here, because I'm, I'm not motivated by guilt. When I feel guilty, it's stopping me. It's stopping me be a witness it's kind of blocking it all out. What is, what's to happen? What, and I don't want to say this to our congregation and everybody go home feeling guilty, right? Because that's not what this is about. I'm sure of that. And I just felt the Holy Spirit come and say exactly this phrase. It's about grace, not guilt. What is actually more important than the past and your past performance is what you're going to do today and tomorrow. And I extend that to you too. Let's not worry about if we didn't witness in the past or witness yesterday. Let's think about today and what goes on from here. I think, and I'm coming to my last few minutes, I've lost complete sense of the clock's on bunkers up there. Poor idea. Okay. So we've got this explosive moment in human history where love and authority kind of come together in a missional thing. And we realize that we're not as good as telling others as we could be. So what matters now? Well, I think what matters now is that we ask God to do a work in our lives. Yeah. On our heart and on our hands. Yeah. That's the kind of two things I've been thinking of. Love and authority. Jesus said, if you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. Okay, so if we really love God, we're going to do what he told us to do. Love your neighbor as yourself is the great command that matches up in our vision and values of this church. With the great commission, we have the great command to love God and to love others. So let's ask him to do a job in our heart, shall we? To raise up our love for God and our love for other people. But also we have to do some actions. We have to take this as an action step this is not just, I mean, personally, I really detest uh, preaching and messages which have got no application. That you just think, well, that, that's great. Yeah, good. I've got 15 Bible verses written down. And when I go to Life Group on Wednesday, uh, you know, I'll have all my answers ready. And I'll be, my, protect, my barrier will be up, all of that. I, I, I really detest that because what I think is that God calls us to action whenever we hear his word. 
And what is the action here? Well, the action is, I think there's a couple of things. We've just got to be ready to tell our story. So just ask him again this week just to refresh your testimony. So get it in a, a paragraph so that if somebody tells, says to you, oh, why do you, why do you go to church on a Sunday? You just, don't, you just say it's because there's nothing good on telly, right? So that's why. No, you say, I go to church on Sunday, and I'm talking about you can say it in 30 seconds, okay? Because nobody who's not a Christian wants to hear you talking for 20 minutes, okay? I can confirm that. I've tried it many times with my neighbors, and you see them glaze over at about three minutes, and you can see them getting their phone out and calling a friend, get me, help me, get me out of here, rescue me. Get it down to 30 seconds, a simple thing, about what's going on in your life. What, what, you know, it doesn't have to be, not talking about perfection. You're talking about once I was lost and now I'm found and this is the difference that Jesus has made in my life. So a very simple thing like that. The second thing I think is this season, we absolutely believe, I absolutely believe that God has said that this next season, the season we're in now for Harvest Church is a season of salvation. Amen. We're going to see men and women, young people and children come to know Jesus and out just beyond our imagination kind of numbers. But that requires action. You see, that's faith. Faith, Hebrews 11, is to be sure of what you cannot see, just simply because God told you. God told us that. I'm convinced of it. I'm sure of it. We're acting on it now. We're taking action steps to that. And the action steps that we've taken is we've created this Alpha Initiative this September. And we need, I encourage you, we need every single one of us to do our part in this this is not going to happen by central organization. I could send emails to everybody in Britain. It's not going to make any difference. Right? I mean, a few people will come, maybe, or whatever. Um, it's beholden on every single one of us to ask God, who are the people I love who don't know you and position me with your authority to speak into inviting them along to, to Alpha? Now, bringing people to Alpha is an easy thing to do, simply because you don't have to do any of the teaching or anything like that. What I'd encourage you to do is, when, and this is what I'm doing, is I'm, I'm thinking uh, that I'm having a table of six. You know, I'm going to host a table of six at Alpha. And at the moment, there's me, and I've got to get five other people to fill that table, you know. And uh, I've, I've got to the stage of begging, you know. So I'm, I'm saying to my friends and family and stuff like that, look, come on. I need five people on my table. Can you just come? Those kind of things. I'm do I'll, yeah, kind of think anything godly to get them to, to come along on the 19th of September. What about you? You see, the thing is, I, in my heart's imagination, I see this room covered in little tables that I've got six or eight people on them. I don't know how many of them, but I, I see it in my spirit. I can see it there. But it needs all of us to be the people who are, who are, who are doing that. Yeah. Does, that does that make sense? Yeah, now, yeah. again, Please hear me loud and clear. If you've got the slightest bit of negative feeling right now or guilt or anything like that, that's not from me. It's not from me. I pour grace on you and say there'll be grace in your words, there'll be grace in your actions, there'll be grace in your interactions, there'll be grace in your relationships so that when you do invite, people will say yes or no. Who should I invite? Well, just ask the people around you. Here's another little statistic that you might find interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, there was some research done uh, which is entitled uh, something I've forgotten now uh, Talking Jesus thank you very much um, so the Great Commission is a call to action yeah. so is, is this, you can google it uh, Talking Jesus and you can get the whole report and you read it I've only got one part of it here that I want to share with you because when I read through that report again this week this jumped out to me as being relevant right now I'm in the last five minutes so thank you for your patience okay. um, so they asked practicing Christians, and the definition of a practicing Christian isn't mine, it's theirs, is those who are worshiping regularly as part of a church community at least once a month, and praying and reading the Bible at least weekly. Okay, so the bar is kind of low, right? We're right down there with this bar. So, um, I don't know, have I got this little graph, Roger, that you can share? There it is. You can see it on there. So, the bottom graph is the percentage of people in the United Kingdom that say that they are not Christians, which is 52%. So that leaves us 48% of people who are identifying as being Christian. Okay. I think, what? That, that's what's there. It's slightly smaller in Scotland at um, 13, 9% or something. But the, you can see the top line is practicing Christians. 6% across the UK. So 42% of people say that they are Christian 
And 6% of people say that they're practicing Christians. So they're, let's put it bluntly, there's a market there. Right? There's 38, in Scotland, slightly different, slightly worse figures. 38% of people who say they're Christians are not practicing Christians. Okay. So, yeah, what does that mean? What that means is you don't have to go to the hardest person possible to invite them. 38% of the people all around us right now are saying that they're Christian, but they're not practicing the Christian faith. Alpha is absolutely perfect for those individuals because it explains the gospel, explains Christianity, and, and so on. If you've never done it, yeah, I, I'd encourage you to come there. So there's a gap. This is my last sentence or two. Between those who are saying that they're Christians and those who are practicing, and we are when it Close that gap in Jesus' name. Not that you can't invite anybody from beyond there, but let's start with those closest to us. On your chair somewhere, you're going to find a, an alpha invitation. Would you just get a hold of it just for a second?